Welcome to the Jump Shots from the Goal Line podcast. My name is Jonathan Dugan. I am joined, as always, by John Henningsen. Uh, John, hey, I know you were in Dallas last week. That's why we didn't do a show last week. Um, but how was it, man? How was your favorite city in all of America? <laughs> yeah, I was there for work. And so, you know, I try not to hold that particular piece against Dallas, but Generally speaking, not my favorite place in the world. So very happy to be home. Um, you know, if you're from Dallas, fine. But to me, it's just kind of like, uh, I don't know. It's just Texas's version of Phoenix. I grew up in Phoenix. I know it, love it. I didn't need like another one. And this one just comes with like a bit more attitude, I feel like. So <laughs> not a huge fan. I could tell you much more like annoying and harrowing stories probably about Texas and my experience there as there was some weird stuff per usual, but, um, yeah, most it's just annoying there. Yeah. You know, you and I've gotten into this before and obviously I have family in Weatherford, which is 60 miles West of Dallas. Um, but I will admit that Dallas stuff does, does have some real like Phoenix slash Scottsdale vibes, except that you don't have like insane golf courses and, but you have all of the same, like kind of pretentiousness, um, that you would have in a Phoenix slash Scottsdale. And then just everything is bigger because it's Texas. So I guess that's probably why the attitudes are different. Yeah. And then they just, you know, masquerade as like, you know, that they have good Mexican food and, you know, it's Tex-Mex. It's brutal. Like oh. we live in Tucson, Arizona. Obviously we're spoiled, but like I basically am offended by half the stuff I eat. Are there. you seriously going like, to be as much as are you, are you trashing Tex-Mex right now? We're going to have a whole army of individuals that have never listened to the podcast before, but their like internal antennas are going to go off saying that somebody's talking trash about Tex-Mex and they're going to come at our mentions. Yeah, no, that's fine. I mean, if you like ranch on your tacos, like go nuts. <laughs> like just not for me. But, like that's not. <laughs> listen, bro, there's nothing better when you're drunk than like a Jack in the box taco dipped in ranch. I'm just saying. So just true. True story. That's a, it's a hell of an argument to make. Uh, <laughs> Jack's tacos do slap and uh, a little, uh, Wet envelope of cat food it is delicious. It definitely does have the consistency of cat food. Like that's definitely no lies detected there. It is. It is definitely a, what is what is it called? Friskas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, it's, yeah. Big big Friskas vibes in that. Meeting. Yeah, dude, for sure, for sure. But no, hey, that's cool that you had a good uh, time in Dallas, um, guys. I did want to let you know um the pod's gonna be moving to a weekly basis now right so we're we're done doing it every two weeks john and i talked about it a lot that we kind of felt you know kind of screaming at you from outer space you know every two weeks where we're having to talk about issues and sporting events that happened a week and a half ago like nobody cares about that right like you guys want the most up-to-date information you want to you know be looking out for stuff week to week you don't want to have to wait two weeks to uh to get our opinion on things, right? Not that you really care about our opinion, but maybe you do. Um, but yeah, you can look forward to it. We'll more than likely be recording sometime on the weekend. Um, obviously, during the day, golf and kids take place, but maybe at night we can try to sneak one in. Um, but yeah, you can look forward to weekly sessions, anywhere between 30 to 45 minute episodes. So hopefully that you know um, is a good change for everybody. Yeah, we do appreciate that, Dugan, because we did get the golf in today. So just to be clear, priorities, that was handled. I've been friends with you long enough, John. I know that it's absolutely sacrilegious to ask you to do anything on a Saturday like morning or early afternoon or a Sunday early morning, early afternoon. And it's not because you're religious. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I mean, some could argue it's a religion. Yeah, some, could, some argue. could argue. And there's some valid points to be made there, <laughs> but that's... That's neither here nor there. How'd you shoot today? Uh, I'll just say that I birdied three of the four par fives and really score doesn't matter. It's just really those memories you made on those holes and, and the friends you made along the moments way. Moments with friends. But there was, yeah, there was kind of a lot of, uh, you know, we had a scratch golfer out there who's basically sticking it to all of us. And then, uh, you know, throwing a little money here this way, that way. I got a sushi dinner coming my way. Okay. Um, but, but probably also had to dole out a beer too to the scratch golfer who, continues to whoop us i mean hey if you're you're making trades on on the golf course where you're getting sushi dinners and you're just having to get out a couple brewskis i think you're still winning at the end of the day you know what i mean 
Yeah, big W in my yeah, book. Yeah, big dubs. I, I, I felt I felt like today was a win. I felt like today was Common a win. Common John W. <laughs> uh, <laughs> dope, dude. Awesome. Well, hey, like you know, not to uh, get you know more off track, but you know, we're not just a sports podcast, you know. And I was sitting here tonight before we started recording, and I started watching the other guys with uh, Will Ferrell um, and Marky Mark, obviously. And it got me thinking. I was like, God, dude, this movie was made in 2010. Number one, I can't believe it's 12 years old. Like, that's insane. Uh, even Mendez looks just as good 12 years later, just FYI. Um, but it, it had me thinking, man, like the, the 2000s, and I re- my reference point is anything from 2000 to 2010, comedies were just slapping, like hit after hit after hit. And, it, you know, it, I wanted to ask you, John, like, if you could lay down who your your top five comedies are from that era, like what would they be? And why don't we do this? We'll go down the list. You say, you know, one, I'll go one, and then we'll kind of grade each other. How does that sound? Sounds good. And I mean, I looked at this list and not like a long time. So maybe, I don't know if this is like interesting enough to do a deep dive on sometime, but there's probably 25 movies at least, at least that are better than any comedy I've probably seen in five years too. Oh, absolutely. I mean, like, you know what I mean? Like there's a couple of good comedies that come out here and there, but it's almost like a lost art in 2000, 2010. I mean, just looking at it, I was like, this is, this is the last time we were doing this and doing it. Yes. Right. So why don't we start out with your number five? Who are you going to go with? Okay. And I'm not placing these in any particular order in terms of ranking. Okay. Just grabbing, just grabbing five. But if we want, we can legislate like where they're, what's most paramount to that me. That makes sense. So I'll start with, I'll start with forgetting Sarah Marshall. Watch it again this weekend. It's just one that, dude, it's on. The laughs are there. I get, I get to go to Hawaii. Yep. I get two pretty leading ladies. God, Mila Kunis, like, bro. Whew, smoke show. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we got, I mean, what, I mean, Kristen Bell, like, so what, what do we not love about this? But it makes me laugh the whole time, right? He's up there. Um, I won't sing inside of you, but like when he does that every <laughs> single time, it just kills me. Um, and then, you know, we could spout lines off over and over. But uh, forgetting Sarah Marshall, I, and mine are kind of like, I'll say my list is kind of the ones I think I'm just going to rewatch the most. Yeah, like maybe they weren't the best. Maybe they didn't slap the, maybe they didn't slap the hardest the first time, but it's like one that I just want to go back to. And the five I picked are like movies that just that they're on. I'm like, I don't know if I can turn the away. Quotability is big for sure. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. That movie, like I feel like it encompasses so many great things of what that era was because it included like music. Like you said, you know, that song stays in your head forever. It included two leading guys that had an absolute run through that whole era with Russell Brand and um, Jason Siegel. Like, good lord, what what a, a pair there! You know what I mean for Kristen Bell to be dating both of those guys and just the juxtaposition of the two. Very very good casting, and then like I said, just seeing Mila Kunis for an hour and a half was that's always an okay thing. Yeah, right. You know. Yeah, just just like. Fall in love with Mina Kudis, take a couple heat checks from Jonah Hill. I mean, solid. That one's just start to finish from <laughs> I've got a surprise for you to Dracula show. Solid. Yeah, that was low-key funny and just incredible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll go with my number five. Mine are I guess I'm kind of like you, right? Like they're not in any particular order. Probably like my number one and number two will be like obviously the heavy-handed, like main hitters. But with my number five, I'm going to go with Super Troopers. I don't think there is a more – there's definitely more quotable movies, I guess. But, like, that movie for the cast it had was just so incredible. And, like, the one-liners, the quotability, everything. And, like, the fact that, like, all these years later it's just as funny, that's that's why I had to include it in my top fives. So, and, it, and it came out in 2001, so it fits the criteria. Super Troopers is so good. And that's what we're going to find out. Like, I'm interested to see what your others are, but we're going to leave out some like huge comedies and Super Troopers is so good. And I honestly don't know if it would have made my top 10 and that's no shade at Super Troopers because that movie's freaking ripped. Like every single, like if you're doing any cop, anything, like if you're having any interaction, I don't know how cops interacted with kids for the next 10 years, 
but presumably every single time was the repeater, you know, like every single one of those interactions is something that everybody's emulated at some point in your yeah. life in some shape or form. Yep. Absolutely, dude. So uh, number four, who do you got? Next, I'll kind of stay just in the same trend we'll, and I'll go super bad. Okay. So super bad again is one that I don't really care where it is in the movie. I'm picking it up. Like it's just Jonah Hill and Michael Sarah just absolutely kill in that movie. That one's interesting too. Cause it's um, like, I don't really get the same thing where like, there's really not like a girl to fall in love with. Like, right. Obviously they're like high school kids and they're, you know, pretty ladies, but they're like young and it's a little different vibe. It's more like a love story about two bros than anything. Yep. And I guess that's something that uh, just gets me too. Everybody man. Like, can it's relate. like when they're laying, they're laying there on the floor, boop, you yep. know, like it's hard to, it's hard to beat that connection they had. And they just, yeah, that, that one just kills me. Obviously McLovin will be saying McLovin the rest of our lives and everybody will know what you're talking about. And the guy hasn't been in all but one or two movies since. Dude, it and like. not even that, but like Seth Rogen and, and Bill Hader, like, absolutely yes. again we're looking yes. at cops right like funny yes. cops are funny yes. like you <laughs> yes. know yeah funny cops are funny yeah. like the fact that they're just shooting at like what were they shooting at like just a car or something and like yeah they like blew up their yeah, own car yeah. and it was just hilarious you know and then and <laughs> yeah. just smoking cigs in the police car like just ripping darts hilarious very I use the line, I'm a single mother, I have to wash and dry probably once a week. <laughs> uh, at, at least once a dude, week. Dude, <laughs> I mean, and then the whole period blood thing, like that will forever live in infamy. You know what I mean? Like, good Lord. Yes. <laughs> yes. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's great shock factor, great one liners, great. Like, it's just enough of a story. Like I said, I get, I get hooked into the story yeah. every single time somehow. It's just, it's awesome. And then, yeah, like the cops, like, it's like Seth Rogen and Bill Hader are throwaway characters, <laughs> but like, but like they're great. Like in every single scene they have is awesome. Yeah, absolutely, dude. So we're on number four, right? That's where we're at, I believe. Yeah, this will be your second one of whatever okay, cool. your list yeah, is we're here. Great podcast host. Anyway, I'm going to go number four, <laughs> uh, The Hangover. Might be a little early, um, but again, no, in, no real order. But in terms of rewatchability, like an outstanding movie, you know? And then like the Mike Tyson cameo, um and then the just the entire cast right like even the chinese dude i can't remember his name right now but he's hilarious um zach galifianakis just insane quotes and then just any guy that's ever been to vegas can relate to that movie um and that's what everybody aspires to do in vegas that like you're never going to come close to but it's just hilarious to watch awesome pick Crazy it's not on my list because I probably don't know. I don't know that I've ever laughed harder in theater. Yeah. Like this is one that truly like in theater is kind of unmatched. Like it had a rock and roll type comedy. Like every single thing was going a hundred miles an hour and you were just like laughing hysterically the entire yeah. time. I'm less likely to rewatch it strangely because like some of the stuff is like shock factor. So some of the Ken Jong stuff or whatever, Ken Jong, thank like you. some shock factor stuff. Yeah. I just want to help you out on it and drop it back in yeah. without interrupting, but like to give him his due, um, I will say like, I do still, I mean, freaking every line from Galifianak is still absolutely kills. <laughs> like every single thing he says the satchel, is dude. completely quotable. <laughs> yeah. The satchel, the, yeah. So Everything. is this the real Caesar's palace? No. Yeah. I didn't think so. <laughs> um, but like every single line he has is still so good. Yes. And like, that's why this list is so awesome. And I'm glad you picked another different one. Even and I mean, this one is hard to keep off the yeah. list. Like I had to look and it was just like, I guess I watched it less than the other ones. If I'm being honest with myself, but like when this thing came out, it was, I mean, huge weekends. We were going to see it once, twice. This one hit in college oh, yeah. and it was like, let's go see that again. Yeah. Like, or we have to see that in theater because like, you're not going to laugh hard. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Moving on to number three, who you got? All right, next on my list here, I'm going to go old school. Incredible and, and old school is just, I mean, I forget about old school. This is one that I'm probably guilty of not watching enough. But then every time I watch it again, it's just like, it's so much darker. It's so much just weirder. <laughs> and it just like gets me and like tickles me in like this weird level. So like, I feel like this is one that I don't want to watch every day as much, but I do want to watch it just enough. And like certain days, it just 
hits me just right. And I mean, come on. I mean, Will Ferrell. Dude, getting hit by the, tran- the funeral. The tranquilizer gun, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The dark, there's a dark in my neck. I mean, that is, I'm sure that's going to sound like really great on audio. But like <laughs> the dart in the neck, the, him singing, you're my boy, Blue. I mean. Yo, that movie though, yes. speaking of singing, a, a, a scene that nobody gives its due is at Will Ferrell's uh, wedding, the wedding singer, just like <laughs> putting his own spin oh. on every song. <laughs> yes. I, I only sing the songs that way. And then people <laughs> like that aren't familiar enough with the movie are like, there's no like F word in there. I'm like, oh, dude, uh, I guess you don't know. The, I guess you don't know the song. Yeah, Relisten to that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, well, I, I guess you just don't know the dude, song. But uh, yeah, that, that movie is incredible. And Alicia Cuthbert, um, just as like a teaser in there when she was like really high on my list, you know, yeah. like I was really a big fan at that point. So again, like if you can sneak in a couple, you know, love interests that you can kind of, you know, have some interest in yourself, yeah. like never, never hurts the, never hurts the movie. No. And you know, man, yeah, you could go with so many different like Vince Vaughn or Will Ferrell movies. And the fact that you went with the one that is literally led by uh, Luke Wilson that should tell you how good of a film it is because I'm not a Luke Wilson guy and that movie is incredible. Yeah. And I, I think that, yeah, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to save it, but yes, you're right. If it holds Luke Wilson in it, Luke Wilson's a joke in another one of my movies. Uh, but, but because it's so funny, you're right. Like Luke Wilson shouldn't be driving one of these, but he does. And it's yeah. awesome. Cool. All right. My number three, um, I'm going to go with, I love you, man. So I'm a huge Paul Rudd fan. I love Paul Rudd. I think his comedic timing is incredible. I think he's super relatable. And then like, again, Jason Siegel, like just time of his life during the, the 2000s, right? And that movie is so quotable, whether it's like calling somebody Jobin or just like slapping the bass. Like I love that movie. And again, it's just super like relatable for, I think a lot of guys, especially anybody that's ever like actually gotten married and you go to like do your groomsmen and you're just like, Oh shit. Like I have a lot of friends, but not a lot of like best friends. Right. And it's just such an incredible movie. And I think it gets slept on. So. Yeah. And it does touch on that thing where like, it's, you know, it's weird if you get past a certain point in life to make new guy friends, right? Sometimes it'll be easier because you meet people at work, you yeah. meet people here or there, but it is kind of a weird thing. And also shout out to Paul Rudd and uh, forgetting Sarah Marshall rocking in his coon. Yep. Yep. But, uh, <laughs> Cause I'm like, I'm like, like that's how good these movies are. It's like, he's the 10th guy. What does Kunu mean? But oh, like, no, it means Kunu. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, man, my, yeah, like, I got rid of my watch. It's really deep, man. He's like, Oh no, my phone just keeps, <laughs> yeah. but like, it's, <laughs> It's like, it's so many good ones, but, but this one's right there too, man. Like this one's so freaking funny. And like, I think the part that always gets me is like the dynamic between Favreau, his <laughs> wife, and then like every, everything that happens at that house, essentially every interaction between Favreau Favreau's and Paul Rudd. In yes, so many like movies. Just, <laughs> yes. Just staring him down, chewing on his toothpick the entire time. <laughs> just absolutely dogging yeah. him and trading every single one of those dinners for a sexual favor with his yeah. wife in the most awkward <laughs> possible way in front of everybody uh, is just incredible. It's just great. I mean, I, by the way, no, I don't know if any of these movies are like appropriate anymore and maybe that's why. And so like for anybody who like, obviously we're laughing at probably I'm sure something that's offensive to somebody. Yeah. Um, but you know, I was a kid and I just thought they're all yes. funny. And honestly, I still think they're funny. I don't really know. Stuff. Yeah. All right. Number two for you. Um, number two for me, I'm going to jump to wedding crashers. So we'll stay on the Vince Vaughn yep. and, and then we get, we can get away from Luke, go to Owen. Yep. And this is like another one that like, just because of like the scenery and like the fun that they're having, it's just like, you just want to be at this, in this movie. Like you, you want to be a part of it. You just want to be a friend, like a bystander of everything that's going on. Like you have the awesome opening montage, right? Where they're bouncing around from this and that and it's just like a joke a minute or like every 10 seconds yeah. really um and then it just then it just gets into the weirdness of just honestly owen wilson and vaughn just bouncing off each other is gold. Yes. i mean really it's just that friendship and all the banter that they have is perfect and then again like you know 
a couple great actresses in it that they're chasing through the whole thing, which make it a lot of fun. You get your Christopher Walken mixed in there. That's good, Todd. You yell at that mean ocean gets me <laughs> every single time. I do think there's like one line from like every movie that just like absolutely slays me. And if I miss that, I'm like, uh, I, I, I might just watch the whole thing. Yeah. Again. No, dude, that movie is incredible, extremely quotable and kind of the same thing, right? Like every guy that watches that movie growing up, that's the kind of friendship that you want to like build. Obviously, when you get older, you know, now I want you to imagine, though, when that movie came out, I think I was like, when did that movie come out? Like 2006, 2007? I want to say it was like an 02, 03 ish, but I'll, I can I can check. I can check that while you're while you're anyway. Chatting. I remember the first time I saw it and like the opening scene is literally just like, you know, him just having girls lay down on his bed and the things that happened. Oh, five. OK, so I was third. So I was, five. Yeah, I said, so I was five, 13 yeah. years old, the same, almost the same age as my stepson currently. And my mom let me watch that movie. And I was just like, wow, this movie's already great. You know? So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's the thing. Like all these appeal to like, you know, the lowest common denominator of a guy's brain. Yes. So like, that's kind of what I'm saying is like, no one be impressed by this list intellectually, but know that I do uh, endorse them to laugh, or, laugh your yes. ass off. I mean, like they are that good. And in 2005, I thought this is every bit of the funniest things I've ever seen. And I wanted all of my banter with all my friends to be just as witty and just as fun. Yep. That explains a lot about your humor nowadays, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah. It, it, yeah. Anything I'm quoting or stealing from or sampling is probably from one of these movies in some way, shape or form. I probably relearned in my brain how to do the joke in a different nice. way. All right. My number two, I'm going to go with Step Brothers. Um, John C. Riley. Will Ferrell, just a lightning in a bottle, like casting, obviously one of the most quotable movies of all time. Uh, I think just you can watch it so many different times. Um, the scene with the drums, the scene where they hit each other at the same time with like random objects, the, the relationship that they have with their parents, even though they're like 40 years old. And then the scene, obviously, like where they're sitting in tuxes in the job interview and they fart. And it just smells like ketchup and and whatever, you know, like that that yeah. movie is just one of my all time favorite movies. I'm a huge Will Ferrell guy, though. So, I mean, I could put Will Ferrell top five, I, yeah. you know, so many of his movies. I am, too. And that's like, I mean, honestly, too, if you're going back to I mean, we talked about some of the lead people, but I mean, like obviously he's great in old school. And then the cameo and Wedding Crashers. I mean, that was one of those things, too. When you saw that in theater, you were like. Oh, dude, they didn't even tell us where Farrell was in this yeah. and he's going to be in this. And then, of course, he just lights the screen on fire the entire time and you're dude, dying. He's had a lot um, of really great cameos. Like people forget he was in Austin Powers as well. <laughs> as fe- yeah. As, as a, the yeah, feds. As a, yeah. <laughs> like, I, yeah. Zoo, Zoolander. I mean, like the thing, some of the like smaller things you don't even yeah. think about with him are like absolutely brilliant. Um, but yeah, this is another one like that. I mean, you can't beat. It's really hard to beat. It's like really sad to not put it on my list. I basically am just picking my own favorites of my heart. Yeah. But I mean, Step Brothers is so damn good, yeah. man. It's so funny. It was kind of like I think if you hit at a certain age, it becomes like what Dumb and Dumber is yeah. to me. Like if Dumb and Dumber was in the two thousands list, like it's like we already had that movie in my life yeah. that I prefer, I guess. But Step Brothers is right there at a close second yeah. behind two dumb guys movies. So number one for you. So, yeah, number one, and again, like, we could probably go back and forth in the order, but the one that I think really I just thought was the funny, and I still, to this day, because it's so creepy, if you can just, you know, change, 40-Year-Old Virgin, (laughs) to me, is just perfect, because, again, it's another movie where they're literally just throwing jokes at the screen nonstop, right? It's just one-liner after one-liner after one-liner of like, I thought you were a serial serial killer, you know, put it on a pedestal, blah, blah, blah. Like, That's man, you got to get into that. Dude. You got the, you know? Yes. And it's like, and it's, yes. But Carell is like, at, like when he's his I'm peak, painting dude. the silver pants blue yeah. is one of the funniest non-funny things I've ever seen in my entire life. And the idea too, like, I love the idea that if you watch that movie from like a different perspective, like, like the girl, she thinks he is a serial killer. And I can't think of anything funnier yeah. than that. Like, <laughs> The fact that they built it up to that and she's basically freaked out and running for her life all because this guy is a virgin is just the funniest premise of a movie. Maybe That ever. movie too, I think, ranks up pretty high for me because like 
the things that you learn after you watch it and then you go back and watch it make it even funnier. Like the fact that like the O. Kelly Clarkson line, like that was actually improv because they really did like tear the hair off of his chest. And that was what he just said. Like that wasn't a planned line. And that makes that scene even funnier. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And then again, Paul Rudd again. Yep. If I hear Yamo be there one more time, I'm a Yamo burn this place to the ground. I mean, him is like the the, the really crappy ex boyfriend who's being super creepy with uh, Mindy Kaling, and then she, her just going back like, "I changed my email, I changed my phone." They're like, "Well, we didn't know that, and we're sorry." Yeah. Uh, like, it's just, uh, yeah, I could quote all these movies, but that one forever, just always, 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 always will make me laugh. Yeah, and then obviously my number one. Um, I think you'll probably agree with me being a San Diego guy yourself, but like Anchorman, like one of the most yeah, quotable so movies good. of all time shaped my entire childhood. Um, like no other movie like it out there. Will Ferrell absolutely killed it. Um, Steve Carell as Brick Tamlin, arguably a, a terrible character, but he made it just so funny <laughs> that yeah. it worked. No. Paul Rudd's in that one. Yeah. Like, and then uh, who's the dude that plays, um, What's his face? The sportscaster. But he's always funny too. Yeah, Chan. Yeah, Ch- I know. He's funny. I can't think of his name off top. But either, he's but. always funny. And then just like uh, the what, – what's her name? Angelica. The the chick that played Will Ferrell's like love interest in that movie. Terrible podcasting right now. but I know. Christina Applegate. Yeah, I dude, got she you. It just took me a second. Absolute smoke show in that movie. Like – You know, like I think 13 year old Jonathan was definitely crushing on Christina Applegate for sure. Dude, it's great when there's look, some of these just have better stories than others. And I kind of like lean towards the one that I I gravitate to like the story a little bit more. I'm glad I picked the ones I did, because I think if we like we put this to a poll, I guarantee you your list crushes my list. (laughs) But I'm glad I picked what I did so that we could talk about more hilarious movies and give you an idea of how freaking awesome 2000s comedies are. If you haven't like looked at that list, just Google it and you'll just scroll, scroll through. And there's still like 15 movies that yeah. are awesome that I wish would come out today. You know, it's ridiculous. Yeah, dude. And then like just some of the ones that, you know, didn't make my list, but obviously are just hilarious or like not another teen movie, like Team America, World Police, like uh, Pineapple Express. Dude, there's just... Role Models, Knocked Up, Pineapple Express. And if you haven't seen me, myself and Irene in a yeah. while watch that yeah it's ridiculously inappropriate and aged also probably but dude jim carrey's so funny that i mean that time of our lives man like god if i could go back and just watch movies for a week i'd be happy you know so yeah yeah shout out borat borat also like in theater the first time you watch that dude get this killed so my mom didn't know what borat was like she watched the preview maybe like one time half-assed and I watched it numerous times, right? And that movie came out, I think, in like 06, 05. So I was still like 14, 15 or something, right? Um, and we go to the theater. And my mom is kind of narcoleptic almost. Like she'll just fall asleep sometimes. And she would fall asleep during that movie. And every time she would wake up, it would be something just wildly inappropriate. Like when they were wrestling in the hotel room naked. And yeah, course, I was yeah. sitting there just laughing my ass off. And she would just wake up horrified. So, like, that movie will forever be, like, endearing in my heart because it was just, like, such a good memory, of, like, with my mom. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, <laughs> that Texas rodeo scene <laughs> will forever stay with good me. Lord. I will just say that. Yeah, dude. Like, <laughs> you, what is it? Warlord Bush? <laughs> Yeah, you just see this. Uh, <laughs> the guy has the whole place though, just like complete. Like the guy was a magician, and like honestly, it's again, it's kind of like Jackass. It's like one of those ones like you watch it once, and it's like you don't necessarily want to watch it again and again. I don't know because a lot of it's surprising. I've never watched that movie. But like, no, no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, you can. I just think like it's like better the first go, oh, yeah. and like it loses some of the shock factor afterwards. But no, there are definitely moments that yeah, it's. That's how good. That's how good the two thousands were, though. He's like, that's not even on the. That wasn't even in the discussion for me, even though I know how yeah, good it dude. is. If you guys get anything from this podcast, this episode, please just like, you know, take your girlfriend, your boyfriend, whoever, and like just sit down and watch a two thousands uh, comedy and just laugh your ass off. Like, I can't think of anything like, you know, inflation got you down 
or a gas party that got you down, go watch a Will Ferrell movie. It'll make you feel better. <laughs> Dude, 100%. I started to watch Starsky and Hutch the other day, too. I don't know if that's 2000s. I didn't see it on any of these lists, but... And, and that was not even a good one. That movie's like not even good. And I was still laughing. Yeah. Like comedies are kind of a dead thing. So dig back into some of the stuff you made. You might have missed because they were making yeah. bangers. Bring back to back to bring back. Bring back good comedies, please. Awesome. Yes, please, please, please. I would die for All that. right. So to get to the topics on hand, why people actually tune into this podcast probably. Let's talk about um, the NBA playoffs, right? So we're in the finals. Obviously, we haven't talked to you guys in a while, but I called it um, the Celtics and the Warriors, right? And I think my prediction even is looking pretty good because I called, I think, the Celtics in seven. And we're going into game five tomorrow. Sears just knotted up 2-2. Uh, Warriors came all the way back last game, one by 10. And that's just kind of how this like whole series has been, right? A series of runs in the third quarter or sustaining runs. So, excuse me. And um, I think for as bad as the playoffs have been, uh, the finals is kind of making up for it because some of the performances we're seeing from like Curry, Jordan Poole, um, it's just absolutely incredible. And then you obviously get to see Draymond be just a wild jackass for like, you know, 48 minutes. So yeah, I was like, you just want to, if you just want to talk about, I think, I, I think you're a little more upset with Draymond than me. So if there's something that you do want to get off your chest, I mean, I just, I have an issue with like, it's not even that I dislike Draymond, right? Like I appreciate that he plays defense. I appreciate that he knows he's a role player and that he's like the ultimate role player. I do have a little bit of like disdain for his hall of fame talk where he's like, oh, I'm for sure hall of fame. Like that one like is a little bit more debatable. Um, but I, I just get annoyed with like some of the antics that he does out there, right? Like playing basically fullback, like doing lead blocks for Steph Curry or like, you know, throwing his arm into Jason Tatum's neck and sending him backwards. And he just always gets the whistle. And I think it was either what game one or two where like, you could tell the refs like just didn't want to call the second tech on him because they, they wanted to keep the game going. And it's just, like, annoying to me, you know? Like, um, he's a little too, like, cocky for what he is, right? Um, I think he's probably, like, a poor man Sean Marion. And I know that sounds like a very, like, Phoenix Suns homer thing. But, like, they do do a lot of the same things, right? Like, play defense. They can make some shots. Marion was a better scorer, obviously. Um, rebound. Definitely. Um, glue guys, right? And, like, you never heard Marion, like, talk as much shit as, like, Draymond does. So, it's just annoying. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are so far. Yeah, I mean, I don't. I mean, as far as Draymond goes, like, I don't really disagree. I think most people are kind of, you know, it gets annoying when like you're you act like the bully, but you're not really like you're not Giannis. You're not really no. the bully. So it's like that part's kind of annoying. Obviously, they officiate him very weird, and he does kind of get away with bullying the officials, like especially to the point where he can go in after the game and be like, "Well, look, they weren't going to kick me out." He's yeah. like, you know, I've earned it in this league or whatever, and it's like, whoa, yeah. yeah. So it does feel like he kind of has like a strong arm on the officials. There's definitely some clips of him doing crazy stuff. He definitely put his feet up like, like he, like on one of the players, like it was an Ottoman. I don't even remember who that was at this point. I think it was Jalen Brown, but like when they kind of got into their little, so he's definitely can be annoying. I'll say to like transition to the basketball, but I definitely just wanted you to get it out there. Cause I know it's been, it's been when I get a couple of the, tw- when I get a couple of the tweets, like I know it's been on your mind a little bit. Like, this a little bit you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like I know you've been chewing yeah, on it's, it. It's like but, that uh, kernel after so. your popcorn is just stuck in your teeth, bro. You know, so thanks for <laughs> yeah. letting me get on my soapbox. Yeah. yeah and there's like nothing worse than that. Kernel. Oh, nothing. So, excellent analogy. Like it's, we'll ruin yeah. a day. Um, but as far as the basketball, I mean, it's been awesome. And I think we, yeah, I mean, I, I think what's interesting is when we left off, we both said, hey, we're going to see Celtics Warriors. You took Celtics seven. I took Warriors in seven. We've been gone a couple weeks and we're right back where we started at 2-2. Yep. And we have a three-game series. And honestly, the part that I would say that I would want to talk about the most is just how awesome has Steph been? Yep. I mean, if you had, to me, if you had questions about is Steph a superstar is Steph this? Is Steph that? I think if you're watching this yeah. and you had a doubter, a hater, um, man, it'd be really hard, 
right? It's really hard to take that stance right now watching him play. Dude is absolutely a legend, right? And like, I think he's kind of cementing himself. Um, some people could even say like a top five player of all time. He's definitely the best shooter of all time. Like, I love Ray Allen, um, you know, and even his teammate Clay's up there. But like, this dude is just, there's not a shot the guy can't take. And the, th- the thing about Steph, dude, is like, sometimes shooters struggle in the playoffs. And Steph has n- like never, right? Like he he's incredible and he carries that team. And, you know, credit to Steve Kerr. Like that is just such a well-oiled machine that like last year they just got ransacked by injuries, whether it was like Clay, Steph was out a lot. And then a lot of people had questions like, oh, the Warriors dead. And even like myself this year, like being a Suns fan, I was like, ah, no, the Suns can get by them. But like, dude, they look – every bit is good if not better than what they were like three years ago four years ago because they have this bench now that's just like incredible you know we we clowned andrew wiggins for like six years and the Warriors have turned this guy into the next andre Iguodala, basically and then like jordan Poole is just the dude was in the g league last year and now he's like one of the best young players in the world it's you know credit to that organization they just keep doing it as annoying as it is as a fellow Western Conference fan, but it's also like really cool to see because like both of these teams were built like not bought, right? And like we see that with like the Nets, how annoying that can be. You can see it with like even the Sixers or the Lakers. You know, people love to hate on those teams because they just have all this cash and they can just buy players. And like the Warriors and the the Celtics have absolutely built their teams. And it's it's really cool to watch. It is. And I mean, again, Steph's just, I mean, there's just nothing like him. I mean, you mentioned Ray Allen. I mean, I think to me, like he honestly reminds me most of Reggie just because I felt like Reggie was a shooter that took on the yeah. challenge and you felt like an impact like the no game. Like no fear kind of guy. In a way yeah. We, yeah. Like a no fear. And like, you just really like, he was running around the screens and you could, you know, you, like if you're a ball watcher as an NBA fan, you started to learn even if you're doing that to, to start watching Reggie off ball, because you knew the offense was going through yep. him. He was going to at least get a touch coming off a screen. And and he was the gravity of that offense. And Steph does that just like on a level that I've never seen before. There is really nothing comparable to him. And then I think the other thing is, I, could, I mean, as I watch the series, I think, wow, you know, Dugan and the computers were right. Because <laughs> Boston generally looks bigger and more physical and seemingly has – the advantage three of the top five yeah. guys four of the top five guys in the series but steph just being the supernova force yep. that he is you're just like you know if i'm you i'm just nervous because i'm like well if steph just has to do this two more times now and it feels like he can do it every single time for the rest of his life as far as i can yep. tell i mean it just doesn't seem like there's any way to stop him but you would think they can be physical get big on him rough him up but hey now the warriors have two games at home in the next yep. three and it gets interesting. It gets interesting. The thing that does bode well for the Celtics, and this might sound kind of asinine, but like Tatum hasn't been a big part of any of the wins that they've had. In fact, he hasn't been a big part of the series, right? And the only reason I say it bodes well for them is because we know that Tatum is the the caliber of player that he can turn this around. The dude is absolutely incredible. Like he has been throughout the playoffs. He's been all season just absolutely, you know, on fire. And like if he can get it turned on in – in San Francisco, like, you know, the Celtics are going to be a tough out because they're already playing, like, really good defense. Like, Steph is doing what he's doing, and he's getting, you know, 47 points. But credit to the Celtics, like, Marcus Smart is making it hard on him. Like, the rest of the guys, Robert Williams is doing his thing. Al Horford's playing great. Like, this is exactly what we needed out of the finals because, you know, I might be speaking for myself, and I know I'm kind of speaking for you too because we've talked about it on the podcast, but I was almost getting like playoff fatigue because the playoffs were just so like they weren't good, you know? And something that I really do like about yeah. like the Warriors in general too is they don't really like hunt for fouls either. Like Steph gets a lot of his points, like you said, just moving them off ball, going around screens, like and making shots. Like he might get to the line 10 times, right? But it's not like he's out there flailing his body around or like hunting fouls. And it's just pretty to watch. It's fun basketball. Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, I I see it the same way. I mean, it's just been so good for it because you do get the occasional, you know, Steph will have that lean-in, divey type 
get a couple free throws. But that's the same thing you see every sure. superstar get for your whole life. You're everybody. We're all accepting of yeah. that, right? If you go to that move a couple times a game, we can live with it. Jason Tatum, he's going to get the same call in reverse, and we just kind of wash our hands of it. So maybe Steph makes more of the free throws, and we yeah. move on. But it's like – that is what it is. What I will say that's been interesting with Tatum, because I think you're right. I mean, I do think it does bode well that he hasn't been his best self, and presumably there's more that he can offer. What I will say that it's interesting too is, I mean, this is what happens when you get these bigger series, and this is why it's always really tough to be, you know, oh, this guy's trash. As soon as the series doesn't right. go well, look, they put a different kind of pressure on Tatum, and ultimately, like, he looks like a really good long mid range jump shooter, a guy that knocks down threes, but then he's like struggled going to the basket. Like that runner game comes and goes his finishing at the rim seems to come and go. And then now it's like, all right, maybe this guy just is Devin Booker or whoever, where he's already been elevated into that top five conversation. But if this thing flips on him, he doesn't have a good closeout games. You know, these warts are going to be, you know, lingering with him for some time. And that doesn't mean that the guy stinks or, you know, whatever. But, you know, if he's in that top five conversation, I think, you know, that's what's up for stake for Tatum. That's what's, you know, for Jalen Brown to be maybe in those, that top tier guys, that's probably what's up for him. And then for Steph, it's whether he can, he enters that among the greats, right? Like, because I think he cemented himself as that guy that is in a conversation for the greats, but if he wins, gets his MVP, and now has it'd be four titles, right? Uh, you know, he really starts to get in the conversation. He ties LeBron. Yep. Am I, I right? Believe and so, then yeah. we're um I'm like, I'm like, I'm pretty sure I'm doing that math right. Um, but and, and then it becomes like one of those things where you're like, man, do we start to have the conversation of, you know, is he right there with LeBron in his era? Is he in a conversation with the Kobe's, the Jordans, and all those people that we bring up time and time again? Right. Yep. And I totally agree. I mean, we saw it last year in the finals, right? Like these guys that are under 25, like the finals really is just a different beast. And like the the pressure that's put on these teams when they get to the championship, like these younger teams, like they do struggle, right? And like we have to give these guys slack because it really is like it's it's such a different pressure than what they feel any other time in their career. And I don't know, man. I think, I think Tatum could probably turn it around. Like we saw Booker last year, like – he kind of turned it around. Even in some of the losses last year, Booker was still putting up mad points. So I think Tatum could definitely do it. Jalen Brown, same thing. You know, yeah. I think he can turn it on. Um, but, you know, kind of going off your point, the guys that are making huge impacts in the series have kind of been here before, and they've been in the league for a while. You know, like the Currys, the Clay Thompsons, the Draymonds, the Al Horfords. Like these guys are, like, battle-tested and they're ready yeah. to go. And I guess we're just going to see, like, you know, going forward with two games – at you know in San Fran like let's see if the young guys can can pull it out and you know maybe Tatum this is where he cements his legacy so I I'm incredibly impressed like I I've really enjoyed these finals so hopefully you know it it maintains and I hope it goes seven and we're both right um it doesn't sound like you're going to be changing your pick you're going to be sticking with the Warriors and I I think just for you know for fun's sake I'll stick with the Celtics um because I really do think they can pull it off are you more or less nervous than when the series started? Because, I mean, we both took them in seven, so I don't think either of us were overwhelmingly in one direction. Um, I think the only part of me that might be a little bit nervous is just like kind of what we talked about, like Tatum not really shooting well, right? That makes me a little yeah, bit nervous. Yeah. But at the same time, like what I just said, like he can turn it around. Like he's that caliber of a player. Um, so, no, like I'm not overly nervous. And I hope it goes seven games, man. That would be fun. So. Yeah, and the best part about when your teams aren't in it is really no, no one's nervous no, at all. It's just straight fun. It's just some, it's just something you threw out in the air. And hey, man, if the Celtics, you know, if the Warriors don't win, Celtics don't win. I, it doesn't change no. my day. Uh, it's we, we we get to talk about it either way. It's all fun fodder. You know, I use the word fodder so much on the podcast, but I don't use that in my real life. I have no <laughs> idea where. But I'm just always like, oh yeah, that's for fodder. I, I don't know, but anyways, so I'm just a different person here, guys. Yeah, the fodder is a good word though. It's a fun word to use because it, it it's a good yeah. word. Good, good vocab word. word. So perfect. You know, we'll move on <laughs> from the finals because obviously we got game tomorrow. We'll be talking about it. Um, I think does a series wrap up probably by the end of this weekend, right? It's like every what two, three yeah, days. We go, we go Monday, Thursday, Monday, Thursday, Sunday. Okay. So maybe we'll try to record maybe Saturday night if the series isn't over. Um, and we'll give you guys, you know, what we think could happen. Or if the series does end in the next two games, we'll uh 
we'll give John his flowers or, you know, we'll give me my flowers. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, moving on though, obviously, um, something we don't talk about enough, um, but both of us really enjoy is just golf. Right. And something that has come across, um, recently is the new, um, Saudi, um, golf league that kind of has a lot of America kind of, um, like tied up mentally, like what do they, do they support it? If they don't, you know, why is that? And then you have guys making just exorbitant amounts of money to play in this league. Um, and you have guys, um, you know, legends of the game that have refused to play in it because it's backed by Saudi money. But then you have guys like Dustin Johnson that are out here making like what, like 200 mil or some crazy amount. Um, so, you know, John, I know you're more, I love golf, but you watch it more than I do. Like, what are some of your thoughts so far on this new league? Yeah, uh, so I'll just say it this way. I mean, to me at this point, right, I think you kind of see it two different ways. Like, obviously, there's like the implications of Saudi money and whatever that means. And I don't want to dig into that too much, but but it is what it is. Um, we know some unsavory or not so great things have happened. But, you know, if you tie back to every single dollar that comes from every single yep. thing, you could probably always twist it and always make me feel bad about what yep. I'm doing. So I try not to even like, think about it that much at this point. What's nice for me at this point is that they just don't have a bunch of top hundred right. guys. They have a couple and they're paying for big names, but it's big name. Phil past his yep. prime. It's a couple other names that, you know, you're used to seeing on tour that you may be interested in. Like Charles Schwartzel won the yep. event, but that guy ranks out of the top hundred and it's nice that he won an event and it's, um, and he's getting paid, but they're just not moving the needle enough yet. Yeah. And, and like, and, and I don't even care about like, right. I think if you're, you know, if you're if you're if you're just psyched about like free market capitalism and you just wake up and sniff that in the morning, then like you probably love this league just for that simple reason that these guys are rebelling in some sort and going and making their money and you're going to applaud that. And that's fine. But to me, just as like a just as a viewer and like as someone is it going to take my eyeballs away from the PGA Tour like they don't have the names to do it yet. And I just actually hope that they are creative enough kind of like when the XFL does yeah. something like I don't want to watch the XFL, but when they do something and we can bring it to the NFL where you're like, Oh, that's actually a great idea. I wish they right. did that. So I'm hoping some like innovation comes from it. But um, ultimately I think, you know, if you're supporting it, I would guess that you're supporting it just because of some weird little kink that you have, <laughs> frankly. Uh, like I really don't know why you would just, you know, or if you watch every single golf event, but for me, I'm like, I can watch one golf yep. league. I can't – I don't have time for two no. golf leagues. Like this thing already takes a long time. I'm curious to see what, you know, kind of innovation comes out of it. But in reality, like I'm a PGA Tour guy until that shifts, right? If the championships are more meaningful in this other league, then I guess at that point, that's when I'm going to have to look internally to decide, you know, is golf more important to me than whatever the Saudi money is yeah. tied to and put those things on the on the Libra scale and, and balance it out. So um, – I think ultimately – that's really my take on the whole thing. I think ultimately yeah. it's going to be good for the game because, you know, anytime you're going to have external funding that's going to be paying guys like a lot more money, um, it's going to incentivize people to like actually pick up their sticks, go out in the course, like these young cats, you know, and actually have an interest in golf. Um, because I think it might have been like Bryson Dish and Bo where he was talking about really on the tour – like, yeah, you'll you'll get a pretty good purse for winning the event, like a really good purse, you know. But everything else, like they're paying for their own travel. They're paying for their own hotel. They pay like, you know, for a lot of things that you don't see in other like sports leagues, right? And yeah, like when you get to that level um, of like a Bryson or like somebody else or, you know, Tiger, like you make incredibly good money. But some of these guys that are just like, you know, on some of the lower um, events and stuff like that, like you're not pulling in massive money. And I think that's almost a deterrent for some of these younger guys to want to get into golf because like, you know, starting out in golf isn't always easy in terms of like the amount of money that you can make. And I think it's just like, you know, it's kind of like anything you mentioned the XFL, but you know, you look at even like soccer or something like that, it's always good to have multiple leagues because then you have competition and like innovation, like you keep saying, and it's ultimately only going to be a good thing. My only issue with this is like the fact that the PGA has talked about like revoking like tour cards for certain players that they play in the Saudi league. 
And I don't think that's like the way to do things, right? I understand like the the human side of things. And obviously we can point to Saudi Arabia and like they haven't always had the best like human rights and like they've had multiple human rights violations and things like that. Um, but you know what? Like a lot of countries have, right? Like, you know, not to get political, but like the U.S. can – many people can point to our human rights violations and like, you know, right. like there's – there's an ugly side to everything, right? And for me, I'm just happy to see that there's another league out there that's paying top dollar and it's only going to lead to better golf down the road. Yeah, I think you're spot on and that part's really cool, right? It, it creates more jobs, right? More opportunities. Uh, maybe some guys we haven't heard of and I'm with you. I don't really want to see every guy who wants to go make money somewhere else uh, be suspended. I mean, that seems a bit much like... I'm not on either extreme on this. So I kind of said, you know, Hey, if you're really into just this league and that's all you care about, like to me, that's kind of yeah. weird if you've already jumped ship all the way over to that side. But I would say equally, if you're so, Hey, this guy played in one tournament and you want to banish him forever, like maybe just chill also. And, you know, think it all through, understand these are guys trying to make money, but if people are going to kind of throw their fingers up and, and go over there, then I guess then the PGA tour has some decisions to make about how they want to approach yeah. that. But, um, I don't know. It's an interesting thing. It's definitely uh, an interesting thing because there's no other leagues that would even be this insecure, right. frankly, about no. it. So that's what's interesting about golf because they are sort of like this independent contractor of sorts. Like they have a little bit more flexibility, it seems, yeah. in, in what they can do. Um, and you even see, honestly, too, if you, I mean, I don't know how much money these kids are making, but some of these YouTubers that are just filming all their golf and, and doing all that all, and building a brand for themselves or they're just playing not even in tournaments and filming videos and probably making better money than some of these pros. Like a lot of these guys have to be rethinking, wait, what am yeah. I doing? So there's opportunity, you know, it's hard to blame a guy for, for grabbing money as much as I take a deep sigh. Cause I hope they, you know, at least do some sort of self-reflection on, on where that yeah. comes from and what they're tying themselves to. It honestly is just weird to me. Cause you, you had a good point there, right? Like you've never seen the NFL penalize anybody for playing in the CFL. You've never seen the NBA penalize anybody for playing in China who has their own human rights violations. Right. Or like, you know, soccer, like the global sport, like you don't see the premier league penalizing people for playing, you know, in Saudi Arabia. So it's just, it's a weird, like, I don't know why they have to politicize it and, and take a stance. Like it's sports, right? Like at the end of the day, like people view sports to get away from exterior issues, I feel like. And it really is just kind of like the great escape. So it's just an odd um, stance to take if you're the PGA. And I hope that they, they ease their stance and that they just use it as like iron sharpens iron and like, a way to better the game, you know, and globalize it more and more. Um, because as somebody that has picked up golf way more, like even in the last like year or two, like I find myself watching golf more. And if there's just more ways to do it, that's always a good thing. So. Yeah. And plain and simple. I mean, this is where it ends for me. The leaderboard today on PGA tour, you have McElroy, Finau, Justin Thomas, Burns, who won a couple weeks ago. And those top five guys, you know, it's just better yep. golf. Those are just better players. And the PGA is still the leader in the clubhouse. So that's why I'll be watching it until noted otherwise. I see otherwise. what you did there. Nice. Awesome. Yeah, I know. I'm really real So wordsmith. moving on from golf, we'll touch a little bit um, on the NFL. Um, obviously, not a whole lot going on right now. Mandatory OTAs are taking place. And you see some guys um, abstaining from, you know, going to OTAs, whether it's contractual obligations like Lamar Jackson or whatever. But that's really the only thing going on on that side of the fence. But really the thing I wanted to hit on, um, something we've talked about on the podcast before, is just the Deshaun Watson situation. Um, he's got two more allegations of sexual assault. Um, I think he's up to 24 now. And, you know, it just seems like this is going to get worse before it gets better. And I think the number I saw on Twitter the other day is that if this goes further south and, you know, it's more damning, the Browns are – their dead cap for releasing a Deshaun Watson is $196 million, which would honestly, you know, bankrupt the team. So I just – it was an odd decision to give a player that is going through a situation like that so much guaranteed money and now it's kind of like egg on their face. 
Because honestly, if it does end up that he either serves time, gets suspended by the league for an, an exorbitant amount of time, which we could definitely see happen, you know, the NFL could take a stance here. We know they don't really have a standardized version of punishment. You know, a guy that bets on, you know, games will get a year suspension. A guy that commits domestic violence will get a three game suspension. So it's, they don't really have a standardized so version of how they penalize people, but you could definitely. There's no happy, no happy endings. Ooh, clause. Nice. There you go. You're just on fire now. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, you could definitely see Roger Goodell taking a huge stance on this, right? Cause it is really bad for the brand. And that is what the NFL always um, focuses on is like, you know, how are they perceived by the world audience and having a guy that has 24 accusations of sexual assault um, trot out there on Sundays, not a good look. So I know that they've done a lot of, well, they say extensive um, investigation into this and the Browns said the same thing, but then, sure. you know, Deshaun Watson's lawyer goes on national TV and says that a happy ending is, you know, just a natural thing of a massage. So I don't know what's going to happen with it, but it, it's definitely something to follow. And it's definitely interesting. Just relegate the Browns. Like I don't need Deshaun Watson in my life. No. I don't. I mean, I just, I just don't like, I just, I'm, this thing is so ridiculous. Um, you know, innocent until proven guilty. I don't want to just throw shade at this guy forever when what, but it obviously looks really bad as we've talked about. It's obviously, you know, if accusations are true, horrific, and there's no way there should be a conversation. And I honestly just don't even understand why the Browns are allowed to be an NFL team anymore. I mean, that would really be, my my biggest question is why do we let them continue to do this other than like because this one I can't even laugh at because it's so yeah. sad at the same time that like I would love to just laugh at the Browns but I can't even do it because this is like goes beyond clown shit this is just they've they've pushed it too yep. far Browns you're ridiculous yep. like you've jumped the shark you're you're beyond you know you're you're a parody of yourself yep. Cleveland and Stop. I'll put it this way like to like. Make it more of a personal sense, right? Like my sister, um, she went to massage therapy, got her license. She was a masseuse for a while. And if she ever told me that a dude made a move on her, like how some of these women are claiming that Deshaun Watson did, like me as her brother, I would I would want to like fight that guy, right? Like I would I, – I have a real um, kind of – I don't want to say like a, a – a real leg in the battle or anything like that, obviously. Right. Cause I don't know Deshaun. I don't know these women, but like as somebody that has a sister that has done massage therapy, like it's just a disgusting thing. Right. And the fact that what was the number that came out? He had like 60 or 70 masseuses in like 18 months. Like obviously something really, really, really creepy was going on during that time. And the fact that the Brown said that they did extensive research and they just thought everybody would like, you know, call it a day on this. Like, you know, I, I could see even the NFL coming down hard on the Browns for not doing their due diligence. And, and if it does come out that he gets time or, you know, he, even if he has to like pay these women off, like he's already attempted to like, that's just such a, just such a disgusting look for a franchise. Yeah. This is just not a good look. For the Browns, obviously, nothing's going great for Deshaun, obviously. But to me, this continues to be an NFL exclusive yep. problem. Say what you want about the NBA, and and there's been a, I know of some few instances. I'm sure there's something that I'm missing, and I'm sure there's an instance or two in MLB that I that I may have missed. But you know, for better or worse, the NFL is the one that continues to be the first to jump in, to jump right into a punch and take a black yep. eye over these issues that are 90% of the time directly related to how men yep. treat women. Look I at mean, Ray Rice. Sadly, like, right? You, yeah, it's just plain and simple. Like, whether it's assault of any yep. kind directed at a woman, no league has a bigger problem with it than the yep. NFL. And in every other – these guys come in the NBA, they're all polished now. Like, you cannot – that is a league where you cannot have major no. mistakes, right? Like – Yes, can they sweep a, a Kobe you know, Bryant a, a drug charge under the, <laughs> under the yeah and, the, and you yeah if you go back far enough that they did have yeah. those problems but to the NBA's credit David Stern you know 
really clean yeah. that up. Like maybe you went too far sometimes. Like, do you need to tell someone how they need to dress? I don't know. But they have obviously since change and in, in kind of come yeah. with the times on some of those things. But but what they did do well is they cleaned it up. Every one of these kids comes in super yep. sharp, you know, knows what to say, what not to say, like almost to a point where it's, you know, boring at times. But, you know, I'll err on the side of really boring, young, bright kids, you know, that know what to say and know what the company line is over, you know, guys that you're not even sure that you would want to be friends with yeah. in real life because you would have some serious questions when you came home uh, to answer to whether it's your mother, your wife, your girlfriend, your sister. Um, yeah. It sucks for the you're, NFL, man. They got to figure that out. You're in completely my opinion. right though, right? Like you look, I, I mentioned it, the Ray Rice situation where he literally socked his, at the time, fiance in an elevator. The Ravens initially didn't want to do anything. The NFL didn't initially want to do anything, and then they suspend him. Then you look at Greg Hardy, who, like, good Lord, like beat the living crap out of his his girlfriend, threw her on a bed of guns and weapons, and was just a complete and utter, like, disgusting person. And now this, you know, it's it's always the NFL, like you said, that they're, they're just not quick to jump on these issues. And um, I feel for females that are watching this because it's just like, you know, their voice isn't being heard. And uh, it's just crazy to me too, where like even now, and you know, we kind of clown Browns fans for a while when this move was made where they tried to um, kind of give Deshaun Watson the benefit of the doubt and we're defending him. And now I don't know about you, but I see a lot of Browns fans on Twitter since the two new allegations when where they're like, oh my God, like, you know, get this guy out of here. What are we doing? Like, even they realize it. And the Browns fans, they're one of the most stubborn uh, fan bases in the NFL in terms of defending their players, you know, for better or for worse. Yeah, to the to the end, every yeah. single time. And to it the should end. be a real, you know, eye opener to the NFL that even their fans are like, okay, we've had enough of this. Like, this dude is obviously like a creep, you know, so. Yeah. I mean, I feel bad for Browns fans, right? Like, obviously, like, that's what I'm saying. I'd love to just go back to making fun of Browns fans in the traditional yep. sense. Like, I don't want it to be about these heavy things. We all come yeah. to sports to get away from these heavy conversations. And here we are having them, right? With golf, it's a different league trying to do it. But for the NFL, I mean, they're king. They have nothing to answer to but yeah. themselves. This is stupid. Yep. Like, this – and I mean, honestly, I, at this point, I would just – if I'm Roger Goodell, I'd be finding some way to just say, hey, I'm suspending this guy because right now you're just bad for our league and you're bad yep. for our brand, yep. period. And you know what? That's unanimous from you know X amount of owner or whatever. You know, 28 out of 32 said you're a problem and I, you know, you're know you under suspension until we can figure out yep. otherwise. You know, And if we can turn this thing around like – and we were wrong about this, we'll say sorry and we'll bite that bullet and we'll make it up to you and pay or however they have to make it right if if – somehow he can exonerate himself of all these things and, and they prove to be wrong. And I know the CBA would be involved in all this stuff and it gets messy, but God, I would just want to put it yeah. into this. And I guess just to finish on a, on a, on a brighter note, we can talk about a few other things in the NFL, right? Like the Rams, they have somehow uncovered Mickey Loomis's. They have all yeah, the money. Mickey Loomis's black magic um, under, you know, the black market like dealings where they have all the cap in the world to give Aaron Donald an exorbitant amount for a contract, which he absolutely deserves, by the way, Cooper cup, an insane contract. And for some, like some reason they're completely fine doing that from the cap. So that's incredible. And then the only other couple topics I wanted to touch on both come from uh, our dear friends in Northern Virginia, uh, the Washington commanders, Jack Del Rio, just, you know, getting fined for being an absolute dunce. Uh, talking about the January 6th uh, riots. Um, good on the the Riverboat Gambler finding his assistant coach for that. And then Terry McLaurin is sitting out of OTAs because he's wanting a new contract. So that could be a new wide receiver to watch. That could be on his way out. Yeah, sign me up for Terry McLaurin if you can get him. Great. Um Guy's awesome. So if you can get him, and that's there you go, Ohio. Maybe if you're if you're a Browns fan, there's a nice little shout out for an Ohio State. Yeah, we made up for it. Maybe that makes you feel a little better <laughs> after all the bad stuff. Ohio State producing a ton of great NFL Weird, players. Right? Uh, thanks, thanks Ohio. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the 
the NFL cap continues to be not real, not re- not real. Yeah, like it's, it's not myth. real. So that's I don't understand why we talk about cap. I don't understand what any of it means. I don't understand any of it. The Rams can sign whoever they want, which is fine. I'm actually okay with this. Like if the NFL was more major league baseball, like where you could just sign players and they all wanted to go there, like within some amount of reason, like I'd be okay with that. But I don't know. It's just, yeah, the, the Rams thing's crazy. Um, Ter- Jack Del Rio's like obviously crazy. I don't even, I, I, can I just add to your list of like I feel like you're just bringing up all these people that yeah. are crazy and all these NFL things that wild are cra- and right now, like, bro. <laughs> Ru- Russell Wilson, not crazy unless you think robots are crazy. <laughs> that guy is such a freaking creep. I just I'm so happy that this weirdo and he's like a creep in the nicest yeah. way, right? Like I, there's really nothing wrong with Russell Wilson, so I use that term very loosely. Um, by comparison to other people we've been talking to, Russell Wilson is very fine, wonderful human being, but what a weirdo. Yeah. Just always forever being weird. Like it had completely gone off the deep end when he was running his own two minute huddles in front of the NBC yeah. cameras. I thought that was the pinnacle, but he continues to be like just we I don't know, weirder, more cryptic, more robotic, more manufactured than even was yeah. before. <laughs> like he's just like Seattle fans, I say you got out at the right moment. You just grab your grab your dignity and run. Like be so happy you don't have to be attached to this. Maybe it ultimately leads to winning football. And like I wouldn't be shocked if he goes out and wins games. But there has to be a bunch of people in that locker room just going like, is this guy serious? Hey, also, just not to, you know, detract from the Jack Del Rio situation, but you know, raise your hand if you're surprised that he also worked for John Gruden and for the Raiders. Just, you know, little just yeah, a little nugget right. there. Yeah. But yeah, dude, like how, did, how are you connecting those dots? Weird, yeah. right? But yeah, the Russell Wilson saga. Yeah. Um, enjoy Broncos fans. You know, he is going to be the ultimate NFL puppet robot that everybody knows him to be. Uh, incredible player. Seems to be a nice enough guy. But man, this dude has absolutely no personality. It's it's absolutely insane. It is, yeah, he just, he comes with parts, you assemble him, and then you wind his back and just let him go out there. And then uh, I, I hope you like rainbow passes and, and, and take he's, sacks. He's the buzz uh, light year of the NFL. <laughs> yeah, he just, he, yes, he, he just, he is not in touch with reality, yeah. it seems. And it's like every single video I see of him, I'm not, I'm not actively on any Broncos yeah. anything. You know, but it's so cringeworthy. <laughs> it finds its way to me. And then, of course, yes, I do feed on it. But um, he's yeah. insane. He's – yeah, I mean, I, I honestly – Jack Del Rio should – we should be, you know, talking about him technically being more insane. But I think it's a coin toss. Yeah. I mean, that, you know. The NFL <laughs> is a 24-7, 365-day league for better, for worse. And it just so happens right now it's for the worst – so, you know, buckle up, enjoy. Um, training camp will be here soon. And then the season, I think, is only like, you know, what, three months away. So, you know, I'm sure there will be more topics to cover. Um, but, man, what a what an interesting league. And there's a reason why they're the number one watch league uh, in, in America. So, perfect, man. Well, I think we covered pretty much everything. Um, like we were saying, there will be another podcast coming out, um, probably in a week, uh, look for Saturday or Sunday. We will be covering how this Warriors Celtics finals matchup, uh, ends up or how, you know, we foresee it to end up if it goes to game seven. And then I'm sure there'll be some more fun stuff we can talk about. Maybe we'll talk about, uh, you know, maybe some more two thousands comedies or some other rankings that we can go over because, there's always stuff in the in the off seasons that you know you can get a little funky with, especially in the dead period that we're coming up on, where absolutely nobody wants to pay attention to baseball in the 162 games that they some for some reason play. Um, so we got to talk about something. So be on the lookout for that, John. Do you have any parting words? No, I just look to the uh, yeah to the dead of summer, so we can just get weird and talk about about random things. So I hope you're. Hope you're in for that sort of ride because that's that's probably what it'll ultimately yep. come to. Um, but hey, man, that would beat the heck out of talking about these clowns that are getting in the news for all the wrong 
all the wrong yeah. reasons. Can we so, please just talk about? Hopefully, it's all fun topics. Let's, let's talk more yeah. about Will Ferrell and less about Deshaun Watson. How about that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like we've been like, I mean, like I, I like it's like that's why just Browns. You could have just kept Baker. I could make fun of and laugh at Baker in a way that's doesn't no. hurt anybody. Like we were all yep. winning. Like what what happened to that? Yeah. What happened to that what Browns? Browns way to pull a Browns. You know so. Yeah, I know. Just cool. so them. All right, everybody. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Um, Please follow us on Facebook at Jump Shots from the Goal Line Podcast. Uh, You can follow us on Instagram at Jump Shots uh, Pod. Follow us on Twitter at Jump Shots Pod. Um, And then obviously, please subscribe, leave a review, share this podcast with your friends, um, and let us know what your thoughts were. If we missed out on a a, a really bitching 2000s comedy, please let us know. We can talk about that. Or if you are a Deshaun Watson defender, I would love to talk to you. Or, hey, if you have some thoughts on the finals, also please let us know. <laughs> I do. Yeah. Leave those, leave those questions just, for me. Just, I'll, be, yeah. I'll be in the DMs answering those questions. John has no interest. All, all the Deshaun Watson fans, hit up John Dugan <laughs> at Dugan Football on Twitter. If, if you want to send uh, one-liners to comedies, jump shots at the bottom yeah, will be fine there we yeah. go cool so perfect guys uh <laughs> tune in next week and it's been great speaking to you as always i'll see you later mm-hmm.